So what you can do is you can run a job that prints hello, I'm, um, you know, I'm node whatever, and hello, there are five of us. But um, what you can't do at the moment is actually send messages, which is kind of the point of the matter. So I'm going to go through how messages work in MPI. So as I said in the overview talk, in MPI, a message is just a number of elements of a particular data type. It's a very basic thing. So MPI has two types of types, has basic types, built-in types, which it knows about, and those are the types that are available in the language. So obviously, if you're writing MPI for Fortran, you'll want to make sure that the MPI library knows about double precision numbers, floats, um, I mean, reals, integers, and such like. You can have your own derived types, and we'll come back to these later. These correspond to either array subsections or, in this context, it's maybe more, the more useful example is, is structures, or, or, or as Fortran calls them, derived types. If you write a C program and declare a structure in your program, there's no way the MPI library can know about that because it's never heard of it. You've just defined it. But you can actually create your own types in MPI which correspond to things like C structures, or in Fortran they're called derived types. Derived types can be built up from basic types. C types are different from Fortran types. Now, it, to a large extent, the interface to MPI, other than the calling convention, is identical for C and Fortran. But of course, because C and Fortran have different types, different languages, then the, the C types are different from the Fortran types. So whenever you send a message in MPI, and this will become more obvious when we see an example, whenever you send a message in MPI, you have to say what the type is. The reason is, well, you've got a design choice. You could have an MPI send integer, MPI send double, MPI send. You could have a different MPI routine for sending each data type. That would be a bit clunky, but it would also not work because you wouldn't be able to be able to send uh, user-defined types. So you you know if you you have uh, you know you create a type called particle, there's not going to be an MPI send particle routine. So the philosophy is there's a single MPI routine, and it takes multiple types. So because C and Fortran aren't um, the way C and Fortran work, uh, a, a function doesn't know what type it was passed. So when you pass an array to a C or Fortran, it just comes through as a pointer. You need to tell it what the type was. So in C, if you define an array as a variable as being a, let's fix something sim simple, like a signed int, when you call an MPI routine, you have to tell it that's an MPI int so it knows, so you, it knows what you're passing it. So the, obvious, the ones you might use are int, float, double, that's it really. We ever cared about unsigned cars, I mean, really. Um, so uh, it, it's a scientific and technical program, and you might care about characters, but you want to know about MPI int, MPI float, and MPI double. They're the, they're the important ones. Um, but for each C type, there is a predefined MPI type. Fortran is different. Fortran has integers, reals, double precisions, complexes, logicals, because C doesn't have logicals. Um, MPI character, just don't, don't send characters in Fortran. It's a recipe. Unless you know what the difference between a character string of length 8 and an array of 8 characters, then don't send characters. They're, they're slightly bizarre in Fortran. Char characters are slightly bizarre in Fortran. Um, and if you're within a Fortran compiler and a Fortran library, that's fine. But C, uh, MPI is written as a C library. I mean, library, so it doesn't match up very well. So don't send characters in Fortran. It's just a recipe for disaster. Um, I mean, you can get it to work, but I, it's just asking for trouble. So point-to-point -point communication. We're actually going to send some messages. Point-to-point -point communication is communication between two processes. A source process sends a message to a destination process. And nicely, with it in MPI, the destination is specified by its rank. So if you have n processes, if size is n, you know that, that, that all, all ranks are identified by a unique integer between 0 and n minus 1. Every communication within MPI takes place within a communicator. Now, we'll have electron communicators later. But for the moment, you know of one communicator. There's a predefined communicator called MPI com world. So if you send a message within a communicator, it can only ever be its ring fence within that communicator. So what I can do and we'll see how to do this later, perhaps, is if I wanted to sort of split my machine into two and say, like, all you guys over there, you do, you, you do one calculation, and all you guys over there, you do another one, 
how do I make sure that messages from here don't end up over there? What I would do is I would create two communicators, and you could be communicator one, and you could be communicator two, and a message sent within communicator one could only be received within communicator one. A message sent within communicator two could only be received within communicator two. Now, for the moment, we're just going to use MPI Com World, which is the predefined communicator that includes everybody. But that's why every send routine, every messaging routine takes a communicator because you can, you can do clever things. The communicator, the communicator, the destination process is identified by its rank in the communicator. So that's quite straightforward. So some terminology in point-to-point -point messaging in MPI, the sender calls a send routine and specifies the data that is to be sent. And that data is called the send buffer. So if anyone says the send buffer in MPI, that means the array or or variable that was passed to the MPI routine. As we saw, messaging passing is a two-way uh, process, so the receiver calls a receive routine, and it specifies where the incoming data should be stored, and that's called the receive buffer. So the data goes into the receive buffer. But although when you send a message, you only specify the send buffer, please send four integers, please. When it packages it up, it puts extra, extra information on. This, so it puts like header information on. This is the metadata. So, you don't def so when you send a message, the message is constructed. It can comprise the data and the header. The header can have useful information. So when you do a receive, you have to specify two things. You have to specify where the data goes into the receive buffer, but you also have to specify where this metadata goes. And in MPI speak, that is called the status. So every receive routine specifies a, a receive buffer for the data and a status variable or array for this metadata. And we can later query that status variable to say, well, where did this message actually come from? How big was it, for example? So I talked about modes um, in, the, uh, in the opening lecture, which is a conceptual thing about is sending synchronous, is, is your operation synchronous, like making a phone call, or is it asynchronous, like sending an email or sending a letter? And in MPI, we have, a, we have synchronous send, and this only completes when the message receiver is completed. So synchronous send is quite well defined. It's, it, it is well defined. It's like making a phone call. If you, do a, if you do synchronous send and there's no receive, your program will deadlock. There is a routine called buffered send, and that is the equivalent of asynchronous. So buffered is asynchronous. You might think, well, why, is, why, why, doesn't MPI, why does MPI call asynchronous, call asynchronous sends buffered? Well, if you think about it, the only way to implement asynchronous sends, which is, here's some data, just send it, and I, I want to carry on, and I don't care when, you re, when it's received, is for the system to take a copy of the data. Because if the system didn't take a copy of the data, I would never know when I could overwrite that data, because I never know when it's been received. So that's why MPI calls asynchronous sends buffered sends, is to make it clear that there is buffering going on. So conceptually, synchronous send is obviously synchronous send, buffered send is asynchronous send. And it always com completes because you just, you know, just put the message in the, in the, in the, um, in the post box. The thing which causes infinite confusion is the standard send, which is the send routine you would think you would use, and you probably should use, is either synchronous or buffered. And there's a lecture, um, Dan, Dan, Daniel will give the lecture at the end of today, Communicators, Tags and Modes, which tries to explain why that is the case. The rationale is that MPI is going to pick what it thinks is the best method. So it's going to say, is it best to send this as synchronous send? Is it best to send it as asynchronous, i.e. buffered send? The problem is that that is quite confusing because you don't know what's going on. And it's very easy to write incorrect programs but that still run, which is bad. So for this course, you should always program with synchronous send. Right? That means you know what's happening. It means if you make a mistake, your program will fail. And that's what you want. You want incorrect programs to fail. You don't want incorrect programs to run sometimes. So although a real programmer would program with MPI send, for the course, you should program with MPI well, with synchronous send because it's the right way to learn how to program correctly. Receive is always synchronous. Receive is always you just stand there and wait. There is a thing called ready send. And ready send, so again, this will be covered in a later lecture, but if I make, if I do um, buffered send or, or synchronous send, I don't need to care if the receiver is ready. 
Because if I do buffer and send, it's copied, it's put in the network, and it will be delivered later on. If it's synchronous send, I wait on the line till the guy picks up, okay? So I never need to care. So this is why MPI sorts the synchronization out for you. You don't have to worry about, is the guy ready? It doesn't matter. If he's not ready, if it's buffered send, the messenger will just go and he'll get it. When he is ready, if it's synchronous send, I will wait till, till, till the receiver is ready. Ready send basically sends the message, and if the receiver isn't ready, it just disappears. You'd be an idiot to use it. I only put it up here for, for, for correct. God knows why it's in the standard. It's completely stupid. There must have been some MPI. There must have been some other message passing library which had it and they wanted it in. But it's insanity. You should never use it. So never use ready send. It's asking for, for disaster. So the MPI sender modes are standard send is, called, send is called MPI send. As I said, we won't use that because it's ambiguous what it actually does. You should use synchronous send, MPI S send. So in this course, when I do say do a send, you should use MPI S send. Buffered send, which is asynchronous, is MPI B send. Ready send, which you shouldn't use, is MPI R send. And receive is MPI receive. So these are the routines. So for this course, you should use MPI S send and MPI receive, these two routines here. So I should be using this S send and receive. So this is how we're going to finally see how to send a message. Um, so remember in C, this is the prototype, right? This isn't what you type. This is the prototype. It's saying in C, MPI S send routine returns an integer. So as probably was pointed out in the overview talk, every MPI routine bar about one or two returns an integer flag for success or failure. Uh, you pass the buffer, which is the send buffer you want to send. You pass a count and a data type, which is, which is how many data types you want to send. So this could be an array. This could be five integers. You want to say five integers. You say where it's going, and you specify a communicator. Now, you also specify a tag, and I'll come back to tag later. But tag is additional information. You, can, you, can, you don't have to use them, but it's additional information on, on your message. In Fortran, the syntax is the same. Except in Fortran, the error code is returned as an extra argument. And you need to specify it even if you never look at it. So this is the number one bug for Fortran programmers. They do MPIS, then buff, count, data type, death, tag, com, and they don't put IR on the end. Now, what happens then is that the, 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 the routine tries to fill in the IR variable. You haven't given it one, so it picks up a random address and your program crashes. Or worse, it scribbles over some other memory. You might ask, well, wait a second. I thought Fortran was, was strictly typed. Uh, Fortran nowadays has prototypes. Why, if I miss off the I error argument, doesn't Fortran say, wait a second, I wanted... If, in C, if I did that, if I missed out tag, the C would say, well, I'm expecting one, two, three, four, five, six arguments. You only gave me five, and it wouldn't compile. In Fortran, it ought to do that, but it can't. And the reason is the MPI routines are illegal Fortran. This is an illegal thing to do in Fortran. Fortran's a strict language. In Fortran, everything has to be typed. Okay? You, it is illegal to pass a variable of undefined type, but that's what we're doing here. So to get that past the compiler, they have to turn off the compiler checking effectively. So that, that's a very unfortunate feature. And it has been fixed in this monolithic MPI 3 standard, but nobody's implemented it yet. But um, not that I'm aware of. So it is a real, it's very unfortunate for Fortran programmers that you don't get, you normally don't get type checking, you don't even get argument counting, even if you use the MPI module. And that's because we have to fool the compiler because this is illegal Fortran. C doesn't care. Void star buff, you know, well, we'll, we'll worry about that later. Don't care what it is. Uh, in Fortran, you don't have that. So we have this weird syntax saying buff is of type buff star. That's just saying buff is an array of something. Don't really know what it is. It's not a strict syntax. OK, so, so if I want to send an array of 10 integers okay, from rank 1 to rank 3, okay, that's what I want to do. I declare, declare an array of 10 integers in text 10. And then when I send it, I call MPIS send. Now, I've, I've, I'm, I'm ignoring the error code here. Now, you shouldn't really ignore error codes. But in MPI, the default behavior when it finds an error is to crash and dump core. So you can spend your life putting lots of if I error is not equal to MPI successes. And it will never get there because 
because by default, and you can change this, but by default, errors are fatal in MPI. So although you should really always check error codes, in fact, in MPI, nobody ever does because it, it never gets to that check. And, and you want your program to crash if there's an MPI error. And what, what can you do if there's an MPI error? You know, it's nothing you can do. The machine's toasted. You know, you just have, you've made a mistake. You just want to give up. So that's why I'm not testing the error code. You really ought to, but... Um, I'm sending x, I'm sending 10 integers, so I say I'm sending 10. To tell it that these are integers, because it's a generic send routine, I pass this magic constant MPI int. So I just declare them as int x10, but I tell it these are integers. This is pseudo-syntax, right? This is 3, 0, but I've put dest equals 3, tag equals 0, because otherwise you wouldn't know what these meant, okay? But this is just 3, that's why I put it in italics. I'm sending to destination 3. I'll come back to what tag means later on and the communicator's MPI com world. So what happens if I run that code as written? I just run it. If I wrote this as a program as it is and ran it, what would happen? Yeah, it would deadlock. Why? Yeah, no, so why is nobody receiving? So. What am I trying to do here? I'm trying to send data from rank one to rank three. What does this code do as written? All processes are sending to rank three, right? Everybody is calling this. Everybody is sending 10 integers to rank three, including rank three. So rank three is trying to phone itself. So it deadlocks because it can't issue a receive because it can't, right? So the important point is, if I want to send data from rank one to rank three, because it's an SPMD model S, I have to put an if. I have to say, if rank equals one, then call the send. Okay, as written, everybody were calling S send, and it's guaranteed to deadlock because nobody can call or receive. Because remember, S send only returns once the receive is completed, but everyone's waiting for the receive to complete. But nobody's, I mean, everybody's phoning and nobody's picking up. And particularly, rank three is sending to itself which is um, legal, but in this case, uh, it's never going to work. So, if rank equals 1. In Fortran, uh, sorry, in C, if you want to send an integer, so, so MPI send expects an array. In Fortran, because, uh, uh, sorry, in C, because uh, you, you, if, you wanna if you have a value like x, you just pass the pointer. So, you send the address of x and say it's one integer. That's how you send a scalar in C. You just get the pointer and pretend it's an array of one integer. Okay? So that's... Fortran is the same. I have an array of 10 integers into dimension 10x. I say if rank equals 1, I call MPI S send x 10. It's a different constant MPI integer to 3, tag equals 0, MPI com world, and I have the I, the I error. The difference in Fortran is that in Fortran, because Fortran is passed by reference always, you don't have to do anything special for integers. To anybody other than a complete purist, an integer is an array of length one. So uh, that that so some in effect, effectively. So if you want to send a scalar in Fortran, you just call MPI S N X one integer. So it's a bit easier in in um, in Fortran. As I said, the number one error in in Fortran is to forget to put the I error there. But we never check it. But it has to be there. So how do I receive a message? So I'll come back to the tag. The tag is like extra information you can place on the message. It's like a colored envelope, okay? So when you get bills through there in red, okay? Normal letters are white. You, could, you can type a message. You can say, this is a message of type 1. This is a message of type 7. And that may or may not be useful. It can be useful in some situations. Um, for example, in a kind of controller worker situation where I'm sending you out work and then you're receiving it to me, so then you're returning it to me, how do I tell you this is the last piece of work? Well, I could send you a special message, but I could just tag the message I sent you. I could send a message and a tag zero means this isn't the last piece of work, and tag one might mean this is the last piece of work. So it just allows you in certain situations to, to put extra information on It's just a single integer, but it can be useful. The receive is very similar, but you say, I want to receive into this buffer, this is the receive buffer, int uh, count data types from source with this tag. And this is the MPI status star status. This is the, um, 
this is the metadata. So this is a, it turn, in C it's a structure that you provide and, in, um, and that's filled in by the, so the receive routine, if it completes correctly, will fill in the data in buff and it will fill in the metadata in status. In Fortran, it's the same syntax, buff count data type source tag com status i error, except in Fortran, at least when MPI was defined, Fortran, this was back in the days pre Fortran 90, there were no derived types in Fortran. So the status is not stored in a, in a structure, it's stored in a little array of size MPI status size. So you have to declare this. This is defined in the standard, I don't know how big it is, three, five, seven, a little number, okay? But you call it MPI status size, it's a little array. That's the number two error in Fortran, is to pass an integer for status rather than an array. Again, because these are illegal Fortran calls, the Fortran compiler probably won't pick it up, and it will fill in all the elements of status, scribble off the end, and your, your program will do the weirdest things you've ever seen. So that is the number two error in Fortran, is to forget to put the status as a, an array. In C, it's, um, well, there's a... So let's see an example. If I want to receive data from rank one on rank three, right? So, I've, so remember now, if we go back, rank one has sent 10 integers to rank three. Now we want rank three to receive 10 integers. So again, I, I declare the, the space where the data is going. I want to put it in this Y array in Y10. I declare my status variable. In C, it's just a structure of type MPI status. So I just say MPI status status. And I say I want to receive Y 10 integers from source one with tag zero within MPI com world and stick the metadata in, in status. Uh, the, the, the bug that C programmers do is they do MPI status, star status, and pass status here, okay? That's a classic bug. That's syntactically correct, because you're passing a pointer to status. But what's, the, what's wrong if I do MPI status, star status, and then pass status here? What, what, what's the problem with that? It's just a pointer. So you could do MPI, star, MPI status, star status equals malloc of size of MPI status. No, 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 don't do that. Just do MPI status status, right? <laughs> if, you want to, you, if you want an integer pointer, declare an integer and get the pointer. Don't declare a pointer and malloc one integer. I've never understood why people do that, but C programmers love malloc. They love malloc. I've seen people malloc a single character before. I mean, it's insanity, but C programmers love malloc to death. Anyway, that's an aside. What will this code do if I run it as, as written? Say, who's calling receive? Everybody. So I need to say, if rank equals three, call receive. So there's two things which aren't obvious here. Tag equals zero is a requirement. Well, source equals one is a requirement. I think I will receive a message from source one. Tag equals zero is also a requirement. It was saying, I am going to wait for a message of tag zero. If source one sends me a message of tag three, I ignore it, okay? So that is a requirement. You're saying, I will only receive a message from source one and tag zero. So you might immediately say, well, these tags are useless because I can, I can type a message with a particular tag, but I can only be received if you knew what the tag was in the first place. Well, it turns out you can wildcard on these, okay? So that's why they're useful. But most people don't use tags. You still have to specify them, but you just specify a tag value of zero would be the most sensible thing to do. What do you think this 10 means? It's not obvious at all. What does that mean? It's not obvious, so don't worry if you get it wrong. It isn't obvious at all. What do people think it means? Sorry? Uh, well, 10 integers. 10 integers. But what, what do you mean by 10 integers? Ah, okay, fine. So, so that's correct. What it is, is it's the size of the array that you have reserved. It is not the size of the incoming message. This is not saying, I want to receive 10 integers from source one. It is saying, I am going to receive a message from source one, and I'm going to put it into the array Y, which is of size 10 integers. And the difference is the message comes in. If the message coming in is smaller, then you're okay, okay? So if the incoming message is smaller than this, it matches, okay? Because it says, well, we've got enough space. 
Then you might say, well, how do I find out how big the message was? Well, that's stored in the status. That's why you need this metadata. It, it, MPI normally doesn't do you any help, but if, you, if the incoming message is bigger than the, the, than the size you have allocated, it will complain. It will say incoming message too big. But it is important to note that that is the size of the array that you have reserved. Not, now, in many codes, they're the same thing. So in, um, in, in many codes, um, the, if you're thinking about halo swapping on, on regular sized arrays, um, hi. Um, just take a seat and I'll, I'll see you later. Um, uh, you know, you know, you, you know what the size of the message is. But there are situations where you don't know. But that is an important distinction. That is the size of the array that you have reserved for the incoming message. Technically, the, the, the um, type should match as well. If you send an integer message, you should receive an integer message. Whether MPI actually checks, I, I don't know. We should check. And in C, again, if you want to receive a scalar, it's the same thing, but you pass the address of, a, of an integer. Fortran is exactly the same, except here, see, in C, it was MPI status, status. In Fortran, it's interdimensional of MPI status, size status. You need a status for every receive. You often don't look at it because if you know who you're receiving, if you're not wildcarding and you know what size the messages are, you don't need to look at it. Um, but you always have to specify it. If rank equals three, call MPI received y10 MPI integer. Again, this is pseudo syntax. It's actually one comma zero, but I wanted to say what it was. And then for a scalar, it's exactly the same. Okay. So if we're doing synchronous blocking message passing, now I haven't explained what blocking is. Blocking means a normal routine. We'll come back to non-blocking routines later. But these, these, these are normal routines. They're called blocking routines. The process is synchronized. The sender specifies the synchronous mode. Both processes wait until the transaction is completed. It's like making a phone call. And we'll go through the details of what actually happens in the communicator tags and modes lecture. But, but, but there's some synchronization between the two. For it to su succeed, the sender must specify a valid destination rank. The receiver must specify a valid source rank. The communicator must be the same. The tags must match. So some people think that this is that, that this is a return value, that the, that the returned tag will be placed in this. It isn't. The actual tag is, is put, put in the status variable. Okay. Uh, the message types must match. We should check. I can never check that that is. They should match. Whether MPI checks, I don't know. And the receiver's buffer must be large enough. So it will complain if the receiver's buffer is not large enough. So there is some, some um, um, help for you there. So as I said, you can wildcard. So the receiver can wildcard. So if I'm in this controller worker situation where I'm sending out lots of data, I'm waiting for a message. I don't know who's going who's to finish first. So I would issue a receive, but I wouldn't say from source equals whatever. I would do from MPI any source. And that means that, um, that means I will just receive uh, whoever comes in first will match. Or you could do it with tag. You can receive with MPI any tag. You can say, look, I just want to receive the next message from somebody, but I don't care what the tag is. To find out what the actual source was, to find out what the actual tag was, you have to look at the status. These are returned in the receiver status parameter, which is, as I said, which was the metadata with the envelope information on the message that was sent. So it's like an envelope, as I said. The, the data is like the, the letter, and, and the envelope contains other, other data, other information. So how do you access that? Well, the source and the tag are direct members of the status um, structure in C. So you do status.mpi source or status.mpi tag. In Fortran, they're particular entries of this array. So remember, the array is the size of MPI status size, which will be some number like seven. I don't know. And MPI source is just a number. So, so a particular implementation, the source might be the third entry in the status array. But, it can, but you should refer to it as MPI source or MPI tag. But you can access them, you can access them directly either as members of the, of the structure or as elements of the array. For technical reasons, you cannot, ask, you cannot ask MPI how 
bigger message was? That's not a well-defined question. You have to ask how many items of a certain data type were in the message, which is slightly awkward. It means you have to call a subsidiary routine called MPI get count. So what you have to do is you have to pass the state. So what you, you cannot, you can't ask MPI how big was the message. You, you, want, you, you can ask it how many integers were in that message. So you pass the status to a routine called MPI get count. You pass the status, you say what the data type is, and you get back the count. So you might say, uh, in Foresight, call MPI get count status, uh, MPI integer count. Count is returned. It tells you, oh, then you could tell that message had four integers in it. It's, slight, it's a something of a technicality. Um, it's to do with the way derived data types. Once we've looked at derived data types, you may recognize that how big is this message is not a well-defined question. You have to say how many integers were in this message. Or you can think of it, maybe MBI just remembers how many bytes there were. Maybe that's why. I don't know. I mean, Message order preservation, this is the, the last thing I'll, I'll do, is not trivial. So there's this, this is a kind of ambiguous statement. I left it in because it makes you think. Messages do not overtake each other. Okay, Right, what does that mean? Well, if, you're doing, if you only do synchronous sends, if you only do synchronous send, then it doesn't matter about message order preservation because I, I can't have more than one message outstanding at once. If I phone somebody, I can't make another phone call until it's been answered, then I phone them again. So, so there's no such thing. But for asynchronous sends or buffered sends, I can, I can send as many letters as I want. Okay? Somebody asked this yesterday. If I send them in some order, you know, what order are they received in? Well, messages do not overtake each other means that messages, message order is preserved. But this is actually not really true. Messages do not overtake each other. So I've got a couple of examples to go through what this actually means. So what I do is I normally have a better... Um, I don't have any boxes. Oh, I do have boxes. They're not different colors. Um, what I should do, um, <laughs> I haven't come very well prepared. OK, I'll, I'll just do this, and I won't do it. As, uh, we're running a bit late. I'll, the normal thing is rank 0 does an MP, a synchronous send message 1 to dest equals 1, tag equals 1. OK, rank 1 receives into buff 1 from 0, tag. These match, OK? And then rank zero can go onto this one, rank one can go onto that one, and that matches. So that's the normal thing. You, I issue a send to you of tag one, a send to you of tag two. You receive them in order tag one, you receive them in order tag two. There's no message order preservation required here because this S send cannot be issued until this one is finished. But if this is just a simple example, and buff one is message one, buff two is message two, the sends and receives are correctly matched. That's fine. But what happens here? <coughs> I do, I do SN message 1, desk equals 1, tag equals 1, and he, rank 1 is doing receive buff 2 source. It's, one, wait, it, it's trying to receive this message, but I'm sending it that one. What happens there? So these, these aren't trivial questions. Like we have to think, what do you think happens? It deadlocks. So it wouldn't deadlock if it was asynchronous, because if it was asynchronous, I could post this letter, then post that letter, and it would be OK. But because they're synchronous, send it deadlocks. So deadlocks, because sends and receives are incorrectly matched. OK, well, let's try something a bit more complicated. This is just the same thing as before. They match in order. OK. Uh, sorry. Sorry, this is more complicated. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Here, I'm sending two identical messages, OK? They both have dest1, they both have tag1. So they're effectively identical, but I'm receiving them, okay? And I'm, I'm receiving buff one, buff two, okay? So if these were postcards, if my friend is in Australia, he sends me two postcards, okay? They can arrive in any order, okay? They might overtake each other in the post. But in this sense, MPI has message order preservation. Although when I do that receive, there could be two messages waiting for me. It remembers the order they were done in. So messages have the same tag, but they're matched in order. So this, th this, this means if there is more than one message waiting for you, okay, then you will, you will match them in order. Okay? And if you think about it, that mean, if you didn't have that, it would be hard to write correct programs. You send a message saying, here's some data. They send a message saying, I'm finished. If the I'm finished message came before the 
you know, it would help or it would be chaos. So, so, so MPI remembers the ordering from a particular process. It's only a point to point um, statement. MPI remembers the order they were sent in and receives them in that order. Even if there were two emails in your inbox here, you'd read the uh, earliest one first. That's the wrong way to read. You should always read on the latest email first because nothing worth about reading. You've been away for a week and you process your emails and there's some crisis and then you, do, and then you read that and it's been solved. Okay, so you used to read your emails in reverse order, but MPI reads them in the order they came in, which is, which is what you have. If, if this was not true, it would be very hard to write correct programs. Here's a more subtle one, though. Okay, so I'm sending a red message, a green message, and a red message. Okay, so uh, let's say green is tag one. I sent a B send of tag one to you, say, and a B send of well, to somebody to B send of tag two. Okay, so that's tag one. That's tag. That's the order they came in, right? But you are trying to receive this one first. Okay, so you're receiving them. So that because I'm using asynchronous send, both messages are in flight at the same time, okay? Then you come to receive them, and they're coming in this order, because MPI knows that one was first, that one was second, but you want to receive this one first. What do you think happens? There's two things that could happen. What do you think happens? Say that again, I didn't quite hear you. Yes. What happens is it... Oh uh, no! Oh uh, no! So it receives them. It receives this one first, and then it receives this one. So it could. You could think of them as both. Imagine they're both in your inbox. Yeah. You um, because there is a message of from source zero of tag two in your inbox. You read it, and then you go back and you retrieve the message of source zero in tag one. So in that sense, the messages are overtaking each other. Okay. They were sent like that, and they're received like that, but only because you wanted them to overtake each other. So the statement is that, the real statement is, if there's a tiebreaker, if there is more than one message that matches the receive, then they will be received in the order they were sent. But you don't have to receive them in the order they were sent. If you explicitly ask for the latter one before the former one, then you get it. Another thing people think is that will block, you know, that I want this message and this one's here. It's not a FIFO, it's not a first in, first out. I think maybe, an email inbox is more of a better analogy. Okay. You might ask, and this came up yesterday. Um, no, I won't cut that. It's not illustrative. So, so, so buff one is message one, buff two is message. Do not have to receive messages in order. So messages can overtake each other in that sense, but only if that's what you want. So well, there's a final, ah, here's the other one. Right, so the final one is, I send message one with tag one, I send message two with tag two. Let's imagine that they both end up in my inbox. I then receive buff one source zero, and I do tag equals MPI any tag. Again, there are two messages in my inbox that match that. There's one with tag one, one with tag two, but I'm doing MPI any tags, so they both match. But, but the tie break is, well, if, if there's a tie break, it's the guy that was sent first. They're received in order, if that's the, if that's the, the last differentiator. Messages are guaranteed to match in the send order, because MPI, um, because MPI um, remembers that. That is guaranteed. This is a bit weird because, of course, um, yeah. The question is how, <laughs> how do you know there's a message coming to you if you haven't received it yet? But that's just, it just works. Okay. So um, if you want to find out the actual tag value, then look at the status. Okay. So, this would match that message, and if you wanted to know what the tag was, you'd have to look at the look at the status. So my my may have yep. Yes, it must have. So as I said, the the only way I can think that this can work is that there is a um, a. A hidden well, it has lots of information that's not in the status. For example, the communicator will be encoded somewhere that you can't actually look at. There will be some. There will be some counter in there. Yeah, so yeah, there will be. Who knows what? Who knows what information is on the messages? On, but yes, you only have access to the status. Yeah, the, the network protocol or whatever will have all other stuff on it. Um, if, a re if a received matches multiple messages in the inbox, then the messages will be received in the order they were sent. 
This is only relevant for multiple messages from the same source. I'm not saying there's, 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 there's no global clock in MPI. I can't make any statement about the ordering of messages sent by me or sent by you. Okay, that, that, that doesn't make sense. Okay, this is between two, but pairwise between sender and receiver, um, there is an ordering of messages. So, are there any questions on that? I think, again, the other thing which confuses people is that, especially in C, this is not what you say. This is the prototype. This says the receive routine takes a, a void, takes a generic pointer, an integer count, an MPI data type, an integer source, an integer tag, a communicator, and a status. But that's not what you type. You type MPI receive, and you give them the, the specific things without this pseudo syntax okay so that's you know that's just the prototype it's not what you actually call okay so i've gone on a bit are there any questions we've got plenty of time for the practical we've got now and we've got after the coffee breaks so there's no um there's no great hurry but then we have any questions um, okay. yeah i've got one detailed question which is uh if you mentioned earlier that um mpi supports heterogeneous yeah. processes yeah now is that is it okay to have different processes within your cluster? Uh, uh, for example, all these messages that are passing, does end these messages or so, 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 in principle, um, the reason that you have to type your messages in MPI and don't just send bytes is that on a heterogeneous systems, MPI, there will be some some flag in the message coming in saying, oh, right, this came from a little Endian guy and I better switch it around. So in principle, that should all work. In practice, I don't know anyone who runs across heterogeneous clusters. And even if you did, everything's Intel, everyone thinks GNU it's all the same. So in fact, I, a lot of the MPI functions look more complicated than they ought to be. And often that's because, well, just imagine that this guy had eight byte integers and this guy had four byte integers. There needs to be extra stuff in there. Um, so MPI ought to sort it out for you. The, the syntax is there to support that. But I don't think any of the MPI implementations do it. They used to when people thought it was a good idea. I mean, every, every decade, somebody wakes up and says, wait a second, there's more unused processor power in this building and the laptops and the desktops than there is in the national supercomputer. Let's, let's stitch them all together. And in the 90s, it was called meta computing. Now, it's about four or five years, people went, oh, God, this is far too difficult. It doesn't work. And then in the 2000s, someone went, oh, and it was called grid computing. About four or five years later, people went, oh, this is too difficult. It doesn't work. But you know, in another few years, people will come up with the idea again, and it'll take four or five years before they realize it doesn't work. But uh, in people, yeah. So, so in principle, yes. In practice, I, you'd have to check your implementation did that. It's all overhead. All that stuff's overhead checking. So. You don't really want it there unless it has to be there. If it's between CPU and GPU, that's an interesting question. I don't know about that. That well, was well, so. So then you get down to specific implementations. So like IBM have an MPI which goes between CPU and zero five. Oh, right. So they, they, so they, they and they will do any endianness. Yeah. Fine. Okay. So in principle, you can run on a cluster with Windows machines and and Linux machines and. Macs and things in principle, but whether anyone supports that anymore, I don't know. 